I'd like to begin this little talk with four beautiful verses from the book of Job, probably the first book written in our Bible. This is chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, and it says this, But now ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you, or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? In other words, the creation around us declares with absolute certainty that only a creator, only an intelligent creator could have made such a world as this. Now, one of the great proponents of this message was Dr. A.E. Wilder Smith. I had the privilege of meeting him some years ago in Grand Rapids, Michigan, when he was lecturing there. He went to heaven, I think, in 1995 at the age of 80. And uh, he had three earned doctorates in the natural sciences, a fairly rare thing, was the world's leading pharmacologist and an expert in organic and inorganic chemistry. Uh, he taught at a medical school in Chicago for some time, but he had roles as professor in Turkey and Switzerland, uh, many places. He was renowned not only as a great thinker, but also as an excellent professor. He received the Golden Apple Award three years in a row there when he was in Chicago at the medical school for being the best lecturer in the university. So when we think about a man like this and realize he put his mind on the altar for God, he didn't begin that way. He began as, a, as an evolutionary atheist, but uh, he was influenced by a friendship with C.S. Lewis, who forced him to look at first principles, to understand the essential issues. And uh, one thing about him was, although he was brilliant, he was very simple and incisive in the way he explained things. You can see some of his videos uh, online, and uh, his books are still available. He Who Thinks Must Believe, and uh, The Natural Sciences Know Nothing of Evolution, Man's Origin and Man's Destiny, some of the titles of his books. He was made famous through a, a debate at the Oxford Union. There had been a famous debate between Wilberforce and T.H. Huxley back in 1860, and um, sort of as a, a rematch in 1986, he was asked, along with Professor Edgar Andrews, to debate Richard Dawkins and John Maynard Smith, who were the two leading evolutionists in England at the time. And uh, you can listen to his message online, the audio. It's just uh, quite marvelous to hear how incisive and clear his arguments are. He deals with the issue of stereoisomers, left-handed and right-handed molecules. He deals with the famous argument of T.H. Huxley having all of these eternal monkeys typing on eternal typewriters and producing the 23rd Psalm and why there is a fatal flaw in that argument. He discusses that during the talk, and uh, it's really very helpful. He would use very ordinary illustrations. I remember in his book, He Who Thinks Must Believe, talking about some primitives uh, on an island, I think in the South Pacific, and a plane had crashed there and some Westerners had come in on the rescue team and they were sitting talking one evening and these natives, these Stone Age people, asked these Westerners about their belief in God. Oh no, we don't believe in God anymore. And and they said, well, where did we come from? Where did this, all this come from? And they said, well, you know, it's just um, time and uh, natural selection. And they began to teach their evolutionary theories. And uh, these Stone Age people began to laugh. And they said, what are you laughing about? And they said, well, why did you bring all your food supplies in cans? And the whole point is that if you wanted the perfect primordial soup, where life could spontaneously generate, you could do nothing better than Campbell's vegetable soup. Everything in there was living just a short time ago. All the building blocks of life are there. And yet you can heat up that can, you can drop it down the stairs, 
you can irradiate it at Chernobyl. You can do whatever you want to that can of soup, and yet you cannot get life in a closed system. Now, if you insert E. coli into it, you'd have an explosion of life. And so at the very beginning of this debate, Wilder Smith goes up to the board and he writes down two equations. And he says, this is the equation for evolution. Inorganic matter plus time plus energy equals one time biogenesis, the beginning of life, one time. And he said, you know, in order for something to be a scientific doctrine, it has to be repeatable. That's the whole point. Why scientists, atheistic scientists, laugh at our faith? Because it's a one-time event when we trust Christ as our Savior and are born again. Well, you just can't reproduce this. And so he argues the case, saying that, that uh, out of hand, you can reject evolution as a scientific theory because it's non-reproducible. On the other hand, he says, when the creationist thinks about this, scientific creationism, it's inorganic matter plus time plus energy plus information. Information that is extrinsic, that is from the outside in, the imposition of information. And he talks about various things that illustrate this. You cannot draw the, the evening news from the rules of paper and ink. The, the information is riding on the paper and ink. It's not in the paper and ink. And so it is with our language, the way we use language. SOS doesn't mean anything unless you have an agreed upon acceptance of the idea that we have imposed information on SOS so that it means mayday, I'm drowning, help me. But it doesn't mean anything in itself. And so it is with these amino acids, CGAT, it doesn't mean anything unless there's information riding on it. And so he has some very helpful illustrations. And you would do well to read some of his books, to uh, watch some of these videos, and to catch a little bit of the intelligence of this man and how he unlocks very simply and very clearly the fact that Job talks about thousands of years ago, that the hand of the Lord can be clearly seen, that without intelligence, you don't have information. Why, they're, they've got these huge ears listening out into space, listening for extraterrestrial life. They hear all kinds of sounds. Quasars are stars that make noise all the time. But they're listening for information because information will let them know that there's intelligence. And so A.E. Wilder Smith was really the granddaddy of the intelligent design movement. And he has some very helpful and incisive ideas that will help you in that area. But above and beyond all of that, as we were standing around talking afterwards, one of the people standing there talking asked him if he knew a certain professor and uh, scientist, and he said, yes, he did. And he said, the, the young man said, he's a very smart man. And uh, Wilder Smith smiled and, and said, yes, and better than that, he's a very good man. And uh, Wilder Smith had it right, didn't he? That intelligence is obviously helpful to be able to think clearly and to express oneself succinctly, and to carry the truth to the world in which we live. It's all very important. But it's moral suasion that moves us. And when you listen to Wilder Smith, you not only knew that he knew science, he knew the God who had made it. He understood this. And whatever failings we may have in understanding the science around us, the world around us, what a wonderful thing it is that the knowledge of God is not only made available to smart people, but it's made available to hungry people. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. And the Lord Jesus said one day, Father, I thank thee, Lord of heaven and earth, thou hast not revealed these things to the wise and prudent, but unto babes, even so, for so it seemed good in thy sight. And so the knowledge of the Creator is far greater than the knowledge of his creation. But indeed, the creation, as Job tells us, reveals to us something about the creator, his wisdom, his power, yes, his generosity, his joy. 
in the beauty and the wonders of creation, how he has lavished things upon us. These should all tell us that we can trust a God who thinks about us, who cares for us, who provides for us. And in all of his giving, his greatest gift of all, was the creator himself. Christ the Son, John 1 tells us that he was the one who made everything. Without him, nothing was made. And the creator himself was the last and ultimate gift. And in that gift, every other gift is found. What a God. How it impels us to know him and to please him and to live for him. The God who has been so good to us. So I encourage you to listen to A.E. Wilder Smith, to learn from him, but to know his God, to seek to be a good person. And by good, we mean godly, someone like God. And that happens because the Spirit comes to live within us and to transform us through the Word to be every day a little more like the Lord Jesus, for his namesake.